Yep. Elaine, are you there? Elaine? You're on the air, Ron. Why isn't she responding? Because I'm not on. It dropped connection. Uh-oh. She dropped connection. Okay. You go ahead without her. Okay. All right. Huh. It shows. All right. Anyways, we're going to have to get going. I'm not sure what happened to Elaine. Um, she's in another part of Um, the fair tax has uh, been around for a while, uh, but before we get into what the fair tax is, we need to talk about what we have now, which is the federal income tax. The, the first graphic shows you a kind of a graphic presentation of what has happened to our tax code. Uh, since its inception 103 years ago. It started off very, very simple, but it got very unsimple very quickly. Uh, you can even look back in the 1980s when, uh, during the Reagan era when they, they simplified the tax code again. And since then, we've added almost uh, 50,000 pages. Now that's uh, legislation, the regulations written off of the legislation by the bureaucrats, the instructions for those regulations, and the court cases that where some things are challenged uh, and they go to the tax courts and they make decisions. Altogether, we are responsible for about 75,000 pages and over 10 million words. Uh, so it's, it's really gotten out of hand. Uh, problems with the current tax code? It's, to say it's convoluted and confusing is really an understatement. It's just amazing. I mean, Imagine a trying to read a book that's 75,000 pages long. Uh, it's, it's not possible. Most people can't keep up with it, and companies spend a great deal of time you know, trying to uh, figure out the tax code and stay within it. It, it also punishes growth and expansion. Uh, but the income tax taxes you on your hard work and productivity. And also, because it's so convoluted, it inspires the wrong behavior. It uh, tempts people to under-report their income and over-report their deductions, uh, which is illegal. Now, I mean, it's done a lot, but it, it's illegal. It's okay to legally avoid taxes if there's a uh, something in the tax code you can take advantage of, but to uh, you know re report erroneous figures is Ill Ill illegal. Um, Lack of transparency, loopholes. <laughs> Congress makes, on average, a change of almost one, uh, one per day that they're in session. Uh, they've made thousands of changes to the tax code. And a lot of them uh, we don't see. I mean, we don't hear about it in the daily news. And a lot of those are loopholes to reward their political friends and uh, maybe put something in there to uh, to stymie their political enemies. Um, Congress uses the tax code as a tool. It's terribly inefficient. Right now there's an evasion rate of about, or, or actually I think it's over, $600 billion. That's money that's supposed to be collected by the uh, income tax, by the, by the IRS, but is not because people are illegally evading the tax code. And it seems like the more complicated it gets, the more people evade it. It invades your privacy. You have to divulge more information to the IRS when you're doing your tax return than you're willing to share with your own children. Congress picks winners and losers. Um, it, as I said before, a lot of the changes in the tax code are because Congress decides that they want to inspire a certain type of behavior. So they give a tax deduction for one thing and they have some kind of, or they take away a, a, a loophole for something else. Congress is picking losers instead of just letting us go about our daily business. It's time intensive and laborious. Um, it, it requires all kinds of time, about 
uh, six to eight billion man hours a year just to keep up with the tax code, not just to pay it, but just to keep up with it. That includes all the, the accounting and everything that's done by not only individuals, but companies across the country. Uh, that, that represents hundreds, if not thousands, of other jobs. You could think of the tax code as, as this graphic right here. All right, this is tax code twister. And this is kind of like what it's uh, what it's like for those of us as we're doing our taxes. Now, uh, when I do my individual taxes, and I'm retired, so my taxes have gotten very simple. Uh, but I still buy the uh, the the software and put it on uh, on my computer, and it's still even after. And then I do the bookkeeping, or you know, I, I track certain expenses and so forth all year long, it still takes me an entire day just to do the, uh, you know, complete the uh, tax return, and that's after doing my record keeping all year long. Um, if you don't use software, you're going to find yourself uh, twisted up in a knot like this graphic. So to the rescue, we have the fair tax plan, and we're going to give you a brief introduction to the fair tax plan tonight. It is legislation in Congress. It's H.R. 25 in the House. It's S-155 in the Senate. Um, it has uh, been there. It was originally introduced in 1999. Uh, today, we have 83 co-sponsors in the, between the House and the Senate. Uh, we actually just picked up a couple of more uh, co-sponsors a, a week or so ago. Um, so it is legislation in, in, the, uh, in Congress. Uh, it's waiting in the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, we're, you know, trying to get uh, enough co-sponsors so we get a debate about it. Unlike being convoluted like the current system, the fair tax is very simple. The legislation itself is only 131 pages. It's not one of these mega legislation things with thousands of pages. It's very simple. And a lot of that language there is language that rescinds the current tax code. Instead of punishing growth, it supports growth. The fair tax is a consumption tax, not an income tax. Now, this is a, vi a, a big conceptual leap. We've had an income tax all of our lives, unless somebody is on, uh, listening to us that's more than 103 years old. Um, but we've had an income tax all our lives. That's all we know is the income tax, tax deductions, Schedule A, Schedule B, the 1040. We've never experienced a federal consumption tax, but that's what the fair tax is. The fair tax will get rid of the income tax and replace it with a consumption tax. So you are taxed on what you spend, not on what you earn. It will not penalize your hard work anymore. The fair tax eliminates all federal income taxes, any kind of federal income tax, uh, personal income tax, corporate income tax, uh, and all the others which escape me right now. And it also repeals the 16th Amendment. You have to repeal the 16th Amendment because you cannot let Congress, uh, you can't give Congress the ability to levy an income tax and a sales tax. We can't let, let that happen because we know Congress cannot control themselves. No fair tax on business to business purchases, all right? When a company has to buy, say, a pickup truck for their business, or say it's a glass company that makes windows and they have to buy uh, aluminum or vinyl framing material and so forth, they don't pay taxes on, on those products. The final consumer, which is you and I, pays the, uh, the fair tax on, on the final purchase. You don't want business-to-business -business purchases to be taxed because that just rolls in the cost uh, increases the cost, as we'll see a little later in the presentation. The benefits of the fair tax for business and trade and for the federal government. All right. Right now, there's up to $13 trillion in uh, both personal and corporate assets that are parked offshore. These are individuals and companies that are uh, are American citizens, but either the individuals live and work overseas, and what they earn um, 
I think Elaine is back on here. I'm yes, hearing... I am. <laughs> oh, okay, good. My better half is is back. I'm not sure what the technical difficulties were, but anyways, um, Elaine and I, I, I can mm -hmm. I take it. You can see where we are. Yes, I can. Okay, well, let me finish this point, and then you can take the next one. All right. Alrighty. Uh, there's trillions of dollars sitting offshore that belong to American individuals and American companies. They don't come back to this country because when they do, they get slammed with a repatriation tax. So there's a very simple way of avoiding that tax. You don't bring it back to this com com a country. So think of what happens when the income tax goes away and these assets will not be taxed anymore. They'll start flowing back into this country. All right, you're up, hon. Okay, U.S. becomes a corporate tax haven, which equals jobs. Right now, we're the highest tax, uh, corporate tax in the entire industrialized world. With the fair tax, we go to zero. We become the, the lowest. Companies here will build. People who have companies overseas will come back. And foreign companies will come in and all that creates jobs and jobs and jobs. Yep. And we talked about the uh, tax gap of $600 billion before. That will be pretty much eliminated because uh, the fair tax is very simple and also it's almost impossible to evade because it's a sales tax. Now, uh, the lack of transparency and loopholes will suddenly become fully transparent with no loopholes. 23% national retail sales tax will be on all receipts. No more hidden or embedded costs that you never see. You will know how much you pay in taxes. And it's only one tax. It is a sales tax that will be levied across the country uh, and it's just the one tax. There's not, you know, all these vestiges of an income tax like we have now. So it's very simple, it's it's very transparent, and it's automatic also. Efficient. Instead of being horribly inefficient, it'll be efficient and simple to collect. The states will collect from the businesses, and 45 states currently collect sales tax now. So the infrastructure for 45 states is already there. And the five states that do not collect a sales tax have an option of either creating their own um, administration, their own system, or have a neighboring state administer it for them, or have the government do it for them. Yeah, the federal government. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Which I don't recommend, by the way. No, no. <laughs> All right. Now, another advantage of the uh, fair tax is that it collects it from 18 million businesses instead of 140 million individual and corporate tax returns. And most of the work is done by the states, which they're already doing. 45, as she said, 45 states already have a sales tax. They have years of experience in collecting this, and we take advantage of that. Only one state sales tax form to file for the vendors. They're doing that now in 45 states. All that will be added are three lines stating how much money was collected for the fair tax minus their stipend for helping uh, collect it equals how much they send to the state. So it's very simple. It's very, very vendors. simple. Yeah. Uh, states and retailers get a little bit of compensation. All right. They're allowed to keep one quarter of 1% of what they collect and send off. Now remember the, the vendors send it to their state organization and then the state sales tax organization sends it to the federal treasury. So there's you know kind of a hierarchy of the sending it off. The vendors get to keep a quarter of a percent of whatever they collect and the states get to keep a quarter of a percent of whatever they collect for their trouble. The IRS it, yeah. Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> the IRS costs $13 billion to operate annually. 
25% of every dollar collected goes towards the maintaining of the IRS. That is highly inefficient. Yeah, and you put that together with the $600 billion tax gap, it's, it's a terrible system. You couldn't design a system worse than this. The IRS only collects about 75% because there's a lot of uh, fraud going on. All right. Unfortunately, for all its complexity, the tax code is very easy to evade by some people. The fair tax would eliminate the IRS. The IRS is there to collect an income tax. If we don't have an income tax, we don't need the IRS. Once the fair tax is passed and goes into effect, the IRS will finish up what it's currently doing. We'll have about three years to finish up what it's currently doing, and then it, it, uh, we'll never see it again. Impedes privacy and time intensive. Suddenly becomes privacy protected and efficient. You are anonymous. When you go to the store right now, and if you have a sales tax in your state, you don't have to fill out any forms. It's the same way with the fair tax. You go to the store, you purchase your item, your tax obligation is already paid. No one needs to know who paid for it, where the money came from. It's Your money is your money. And you determine by your spending habits on how much you pay in taxes. Yep. Um, instead of Congress picking the losers and winners, or winners and losers, the fair tax is fair because it's one rate for all consumers. Everybody pays the fair tax, but then, Elaine, take this one. The pre-bid assures no one pays fair tax up to the poverty level. Instead of the convoluted rules for deductions and so forth, it, and you will actually, under the fair tax, receive a refund on a monthly basis for what you would spend on the fair tax up to your poverty level. This makes sure, the, the, the prebate is the key to fairness. The fair tax simply wouldn't work. And this chart shows you an example. Uh, for the current uh, year, uh, it, it, an average family of, say, a mom and dad and two kids, if you look on the right-hand side, the line that's highlighted in green, all right, family with two children, uh, HHS, the Health and Human Services, uh, you know, the, the federal department, determines that for a family of four, mom and dad, two kids, it takes about $32,000 just for the basic necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, basic medical care, and so forth. All right. Now, of course, when they go out groceries and they pay the rent or they're paying the mortgage or they buy a house or whatever, uh, a car and so forth, clothing, they're going to pay the fair tax on everything that they purchase, everything, all right? because everybody pays the fair tax. But to make sure that you don't pay the fair tax on the basic necessities, they will be reimbursed at the beginning of the month. So all they do is they fill out a small form. These are the people in our family. These are their social security numbers. That is the only submission to the federal government. And the size of the household determines the size of the prebate. And they will get that prebate at the beginning of the month, which will reimburse them in advance, hence the uh, nickname prebate, uh, reimburse them in advance for just the taxes they will be paying on the basic necessities. So it's a wash, all right? So people who are living just at the, the uh, poverty level, they will be rendered essentially tax-free, all right? If they get a raise and they start spending more than the poverty level, well, that's good, but they'll pay, uh, they'll pay the taxes on that too. The impact on prices. Currently, businesses in, in, yeah, business income taxes and compliance costs are passed on to the consumer. This is what we have been referring to as the embedded taxes. Yeah. And the embedded tax amounts to about 22%. It's a little more in some industries, a little less in others, but on average, it's about 22%. That means that every service that you pay for and every new product that you purchase, about 22% of the cost of that item 
is due to the current tax code and the complexity of uh, complying with it. Not, not just the taxes itself, but the complying with it. So about 22% of everything we purchase it is, is due to the current tax code, wildly inefficient. With the fair tax, and the embedded, embedded tax are eliminated. Compliance costs reduced 80 to 90 percent for businesses. For an individual, it's about 99.9 .9 percent. All you have to do is, like Ron said, is fill out that one postcard a year telling everybody what your, um, who is in your household and what their social security numbers are. Who opposes the fair tax? Well, Anyone whose income is derived from the current tax code, such as lobbyists, some politicians, not all, not all the elected officials. We do have some good people up in Washington that understand that the fair tax is the best way to go. But a lot of politicians are in it for themselves. IRS workers uh, and some accountants who work only on tax returns. However, Elaine, we know of at least one IRS worker who gets it. Is that correct? That's correct. I'll tell you just a little short story. Our daughter had to go to our local IRS uh, office in order to sign some paper that she had forgotten to sign or something. She's sitting in the lobby with six or seven other people. The IRS agent came in. He's unlocking his office door. And just as he about to enter into his office, he turns back, looks at the people in the lobby, and says, you know, if we had the fair tax, none of you would have to be here. Our daughter couldn't wait to get out of that office and just phone me up and tell me that story. So there's at least one IRS agent that gets it. OK, that's the uh, end of our initial presentation. We're going to take some time to uh, answer some questions. Uh, Larry, Larry, do you have the questions there? I do. And uh, we're not loaded with questions yet, but we've got a couple. We'll start with uh, my friend Hank. Hank, good to see you again. The question, Ron, is most states use both an income tax and a sales tax. Why won't that work for the federal government? Mm. Oh, dear Lord. We can't give them both. They can't <laughs> control themselves. <laughs> I, I think... Uh, this is a difficult question to answer. I think at the state level, you have more control with what goes on uh, in your, you know, in your state legislature. The federal government has gotten kind of removed from us, and we've seen Congress, you know, in action, and it's it's not good. Uh, along with the crazy tax code and the wild spending and so forth, um, I think a lot of people just feel that the federal government would not be able to control themselves. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Early on in uh, our involvement in the fair tax, we're helping our friends Nick and Barb. And yes, it's all their fault for getting us involved in this. But anyways, we were at an event with them, and I was handing out some uh, brochures and so forth. And I had one lady come by, and I offered it to her. She says, no, I'm from the UK. That doesn't apply to me. And then she, she talked to me, and she said, don't let them do what they did to us. They added a sales tax over there. It's a VAT tax, V-A-T. They added a sales tax to our income tax, telling us that they would be able to reduce the income tax if they put in this VAT tax. Did they reduce the income tax? No. They got both of them. And now they're being taxed up the, you know, up the yin yang. So, I no. Think you will, I think you will also find that those states that do have an income tax, if the federal government goes to a straight fair tax, that you'll see the income tax in those states drop off. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And, and you know, there's a couple of states, though, that are good examples why we will, would not want to see a sales tax and an income tax nationally. And that's Kansas and Connecticut. <clears throat> and let's just, forgetting the states, just think about We've got an income tax now, which is so complex, it's unmanageable. If we had an income tax and a sales tax, it would only add to the total complexity. Our, mm -hmm. founders, our founders warned us about avoiding an income tax of any kind and knew that only a, a state 
uh, not an estate, but a uh, excise type tax and tariffs would be sufficient. Now, sales tax is a form of excise tax, so that's why it's constitutionally acceptable. But I don't think we want to give Congress the power to be able to tax us both on sales and on income. Larry's right about the Founding Fathers. I mean, why was there a 16th Amendment? Because the original Constitution forbade an income tax. The Founding Fathers knew that an income tax could be abused. That's why they made it impossible in the original Constitution. That was a big mistake 103 years ago. Okay, the next question is from Josh. Josh says, politicians won't read a bill that is a thousand plus pages long, but want us to be, want us to file a 1040, which is a thousand pages plus long. Well, I guess that's not a question. That's just a comment of revelation. Thanks, Josh. He's absolutely, well, he's absolutely right. Yeah, it's kind of a double standard, isn't it? And, uh, and John has a comment also. He says, HJR 16 is the bill to repeal the 16th Amendment, not the fair tax legislation. HR 25 does not do that. And I noticed that the slide says that, but uh, it's, it's incorrect, and we'll have to get that uh, changed. That's it might be of uh, interest uh, to someone, but the IRS code actually is 2.4 million words. And then if you add the regulations, the regulations are 7.7 .7 million words. So you wind up with um, nine point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we hey, we got to we got to move on. Okay, <laughs> listen. Oh, these guys are full of trivia too. Wow. Uh, another another one from Josh here. The thirteen billion dollars that we spend on the IRS is money we can pay off our national debt with. That's another That's right. comment. Thank you, John. Where's some questions yep. here? Yep. Uh, let's see. Okay, we got uh, Hank again. Let's see what Hank is asking. Uh, whose definition of the poverty level is the prebate based on? Department of Health and Human Services, a federal department. Okay. Hank, Hank is pulling your leg a little bit. I, he has, has asked this question before. And what he is stating accurately is that we actually adjust the human uh, Department of Human and Health, uh, HHS. A, 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 yeah, but, uh, we actually adjust their table uh, by adding 24 by double, actually doubling the rate for the married couple, and then increasing each bracket accordingly, proportionately. Uh, it's not the true uh, schedule as it is released, but every other the, every other department that is uh, administering any kind of, of uh, program for the government adjusts that original basis anyway, Hank, and you know that. So I don't know why you keep asking that question, but I'm glad to see you participating with us. Uh, let's see who else we got here. John is saying, where'd he go? John, John. 90% of U.S. retail sales emits from 10% of the retailers, mm -hmm. the big box stores, and national chains. And they have elaborate point-of-sale systems that make tax evasion virtually impossible. That's why almost all tax evasion comes from those businesses that contribute only 10% of sales tax revenue. So, and, and, and John is right. Most of, sometimes we get asked about the corruption, about evading the fair tax. And John's point is that even if there are some that do, and there will be, they will, the amount of money that they are evading is so little, it won't even be noticed. And another aspect is that, remember, oh. it's not the, not the federal government that's collecting it directly from the vendors. It's the state government. And this, most of the state's governments have been doing this for a while. And they catch up with these folks. They know how to look for people that are, you know, playing fast and loose with the laws, and they hammer them pretty hard. Okay, we had a hand up here from Peggy, <clears throat> and when I clicked on it, it went away. Peggy, you're you are unmuted if you can hear us, and you have something to say. She may have clicked on that. She may have clicked on that inadvertently when she was uh, yeah. logging in. 
Yeah. All right, so we will uh, mute her again, and we're ready for the uh, special topic, Ron. Okay. The special topic tonight is the impact of the fair tax on low-income earners. There's, on the part of some people, there is kind of a, a knee-jerk reaction when you talk about the fair tax. If they have not studied it, and they, they, all they know is that it's a sales tax. And sometimes, like I said, there's a knee-jerk reaction. It's a sales tax, therefore it's hard on the, uh, the lower, you know, the poor. It's regressive, it hurts the poor. Well, that's what the prebate for, and that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. The fair tax is not regressive, all right? It does not hurt the poor, and here are the following reasons. There's no income tax liability under the fair tax. What you earn is yours. It is not the federal government's. There is no federal withholding. Now think of this. Uh, the mom and dad and two kids, the, the family is just getting by. Uh, either one or both of the parents is working. Before they bring a paycheck home, they have to, the employer has to remove the income tax, usually about 15%, and the FICA tax, the uh, Social Security and Medicare, which add up to about 23%, all right? Now, with no federal withholding, because there's no income tax, they suddenly get a raise. And as Larry has pointed out to us, compared to what they were taking home, that 23% can be looked at as a 30% raise. In other words, they get their full paycheck. Whatever numbers you want to put to it, they get their full paycheck. They're, they're going to suddenly have a little bit more cash, or maybe a lot more cash, uh, that they're taking home. This does not affect, like, if there's an insurance program or something going on with the state. This is strictly federal withholding. And they get the prebate. On top of getting their increase in pay because of no federal withholding, you get the prebate, which, as we said before, is a reimbursement of what you spend on the fair tax up to your poverty level. Um, the COLA formula. Larry, I'm going to ask you to explain this because uh, you have a better handle on this one than I do. Are you there, Larry? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm here, but I was muted. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the, uh, the COLA formula is the cost of living adjustment that is done every year, even though sometimes their result comes out to zero like it has last year. But the COLA formula will actually be modified so that any increase in prices, which would, of course, cause a, a domino effect on increasing the sales tax collected for that item, Will be will be adjusted so that seniors, those or those any of those any people on any of the federal uh, relief programs, whether it be Social Security uh, or others of that such, and I don't I'm not familiar with all of the uh, entitlement programs, but they will never feel the effect of any increase in prices to their uh, buying habits. So they are going to be totally protected, and it's a simple, simple thing to do. And uh, they were for, they had enough foresight, the people that wrote the fair tax, uh, to consider how the fair tax as a sales tax would affect the uh, the senior citizens, most of many of which are on lower, are in the lower income class, and therefore they'll be uh, taken care of by this little change to the formula, Ron. Yep. Okay, investment income, I should say the interest on investment income is not taxed, all right? So if you're in a plan, uh, you're working for somebody and they have some kind of a retirement plan and they're putting a little bit away uh, for you each, each paycheck and so forth, all right, they usually take it out of pre-tax dollars uh, and then, you know, put it into a savings and then when you, you take it out when you're retired, and at that time, you pay the taxes on the interest. Well, there will be no income tax under the fair tax. So there will be no taxes levied on the interest and dividends. You will, whatever interest and dividends you earn, you get the whole thing. 
you don't have to share it with anybody. So that's another advantage. Used items are not subject to the fair tax. Once an item has been taxed once, it is never taxable again, unlike under the present system where you can get double, quadruple taxation on the same item. So I, an item such as a car, if the t fair tax was already paid on that when it was new, then you do not pay the fair tax if you want to buy a used car. If you're a family just getting by, now you, as Ron said, there's no taxes on your um, savings. So you're building up for a new house, let's say, or a house, let's put it that way. You don't have to get a new house and pay the fair tax on it. You can buy a used house and there's no fair tax. So you've got more money to spend and there's no tax on used goods, so consequently, depending on your taxing or your uh, spending habits, you determine, again, how much taxes you pay. So when you put all these together, again, you know, the title at the top of this slide here is the fair tax is not regressive. The fair tax does not hurt the lower income people. It, it will treat them uh, it will treat them very nicely. In fact, uh, our, our numbers person, Dr. Karen Walby, uh, she has done a lot of work on, all right, what happens with the fair tax? Yes, prices may go up, but people are going to have more disposable cash. Everybody, everybody at every income level is going to have a higher purchasing power under the fair tax than they do now. You're taking the tax burden that on 140 million tax returns and you're spreading it out to everybody in the country. And that includes people who may not be here legally. They will pay the fair tax too, although they won't get the prebate. So the fair tax is not regressive. It does not hurt the lower income people. It really will be a blessing for these folks as it will for everybody else. The higher your income, um, the less the advantage, but it's still going to be an advantage. And, and it's going to simplify stuff. It's really going to promote the economy as we talked about, it's going to create jobs, it's going to promote the economy. Things are going to be good under the fair tax. To get involved, there are several things. Um, you can get more information by going to fairtax.org. That is the, the uh, website of the Americans for Fair Taxation. Uh, the Americans for Fair Taxation was started back in 95. Uh, the president of the group uh, lives here in Florida. Um, or you can go to your state fair tax organization. Now, we, we, Larry and Elaine and I are all in Florida. We're all volunteers with the Florida Fair Tax Education Association, and flfairtax.org is our organization. Uh, or you, you can, can go to bigsolution.org. Yep. Big Solution is a new website that we've created. It makes it very simple. If you want really good information about fair tax and you want to get out into the nitty-gritty, you can go to fairtax.org. It's got more information than you can shake a stick at. If you go to bigsolution.org, it's a simple website for you to connect with us, for you to contribute. Um, it is a very... Uh, it's an easy way to get involved in the fair tax. Yeah, and we need your involvement. And to be, uh, uh, as uh, some people say, a crass commercial announcement, um, we need you to contribute too. All right, a lot of people, when they're first introdu introduced to the fair tax and they study it, they say, this is really good. Why well, haven't I heard about it before? Well, we've been working hard, but we don't have a large war chest. If we if we could put flashy ads on TV and inform more people, we would be a lot better off. So we really need your contributions to help us spread the word. Uh, Give time. Volunteer. Uh, you never get to the end of your journey if you don't take that first step. You can't get someplace if you don't move. Volunteer. Go to your local um, fair tax organizer and say, I'm willing to help. Um, you can either join a local group or you can start a local group. Join, start. I think I left something out there. Uh, yeah, you can either join. All right, I got to fix that. 
<laughs> you can join a local group, and you can find out if there's a local group up in, by going to fairtax.org. Click the button for Get Involved and follow the links there, and you'll be able to find out what your state organization consists of, and, and from that, if there's any local groups. If not, maybe you can start one. I know there's a lot of uh, different things that are uh, drawing our attention, but this is really important, that the fair tax is truly going to help our country. So either, uh, yeah, you can join, start a local group. Bring people to the webinar. If you liked uh, what you heard tonight, join us again each month. Uh, bring other people with you. Um, we're here the fourth Thursday of every month, except Thursday, um, November and December, because those are Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, but uh, we're here every other month, and um, we'd be very happy to welcome you into the family. Another way to learn about fair tax, uh, fair tax is to listen to Fair Tax Power Radio. It's the radio show that's not on the radio. It's a series of podcasts. And uh, if you're an iTunes user, our podcasts are on iTunes. Otherwise, you can go to a website called Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com, Spreaker, and look for the Fair Tax Guys or Fair Tax Power Radio. Um, tomorrow morning at 7.30, a new episode will be posted on Spreaker. Spreaker automatically sends it out to others. Uh, Bob Paxton and I are the uh, Fair Tax Guys. Uh, we take a different subject every week and we discuss it. It's 30 minutes long. It's free. It's a good way to keep up with what's going on in the fair tax. Communicate regularly with your elected officials. I cannot tell you how important this is. Mm. Pressure them, pressure them, pressure them. If they are not a member uh, or a co-sponsor of the tax bill, keep calling them, keep going by, telling them you want them to be co a co-sponsor. And if you're lucky enough to have a congressman who is a co-sponsor or a senator who is a co-sponsor, thank them. Don't forget to thank them. It's very important. Uh, I should have included uh, elected officials and candidates. All right, Keep after the candidates. Uh, every once in a while, you hear a candidate who's not too sure about the fair tax, and they'll say something like, well, it needs more study. It's got $22 million worth of research behind it. How much more study do you want? Okay, uh, read the books. Uh, the, the original books by Bortz and Linder, Neil Bortz and John Linder. Uh, you, if you're not familiar with Neil Bortz, he used to be on the radio. John Linder was a congressman, and he was the original co-sponsor of H.R. 25. He's since retired. Uh, they published a book in 05, the Fair Tax book, and then three years later, they published a sequel uh, the Fair Tax Answering the Critics. And also we have a very simple book. The ABS stands for America's Big Solution. Uh, this is an electronic book that you can find on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and uh, what's the third one, hon? It escapes me. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I'm s <laughs> well, those are the two big ones anyway. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah, senior moment. Uh, you can buy it electronically for like $2.99, or on Amazon you also have the option of getting a print version, which is uh, a little more expensive because apparently paper and ink is a lot more expensive than electrons. Uh, but that's a very simple introduction to the fair tax. Read the legislation. You can do it yourself. It's only 131 pages, double-spaced. It's not one of these gargantuan things that the... Uh, Congress likes to push through without reading. Read the legislation for yourself. Order from FairTaxLogoStore.com. That's the website. We have a promotional store. You can buy pens, uh, scrolling banners, uh, magnetic signs, bumper stickers, jackets, hats, shirts, all kinds of things. Show your support for the fair tax. Go on there. Oh, and one of the one of the hottest items right now is the uh, Fairtax business card. It's a business card size uh, promo pr yeah, promotional item that has some basic information about the Fairtax on one side, and it's got the prebate schedule on the other side. That was developed by one of the volunteers in Gainesville, and Elaine uh, added her magic to it and made it a little bit more attractive, 
And that is the hottest selling item in the uh, logo store right now. Open your mouth. The time for being silent has long gone. You need to talk to your family, your friends, your neighbors, anybody who mentions taxation or complaining about not having jobs. Talk to them. Open your mouth and talk about the fair tax. Also, letters to the editor. You don't have to be an expert to express your support for the fair tax. You can write a letter to the editor that says, you know, I am uh, just started learning about this fair tax, but so far what I like uh, uh, sounds pretty good, and I'm going to study it some more. Just that kind of support will get other people interested. Now, you'll also draw sometimes some negative comments. Well, the fair tax won't work because it's a sales tax and it hurts the poor, you know, which we've dispelled tonight. And you'll get a dialogue going. And also, uh, newspapers not only have print version, but they have the online version too. And in the print, you're usually limited to like 250 or 300 words for a letter to the editor. But online, you can write as much as you want. And so we like to engage these people online. When uh, one of us gets a nice letter to the editor in there, and then we have, there are some people that always take pot shots at the fair tax. Um, it's the same people over and over again. And it gives us a chance to respond to them, and everybody else can see it too. So it, letters to the editor work in several ways. And das Enda, that's the end of our presentation. Do we have uh, uh, more questions, Larry? Well, we'll take a look at that right now. Uh, I, yeah, we've got a couple coming up here. Okay, good. Uh, this one is from Brian. And he said he tried the Fairtax logo, FairtaxLogoStore.com, and it doesn't work. FairtaxLogoStore.org does work. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's .org. Yeah. You're, you're a goofball. Okay, let's see who we got next here. All right, John has got a comment here, and I can't read the whole thing. Oh, there we go. Uh, John is saying, poor working Americans still pay payroll tax and have lower income since the employer lowers pay to pay the employer portion of the payroll tax. That goes away under the fair tax. So the right. poor benefits significantly under the fair tax. Yep. Well, no disagreement right. there. Thank you, John. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, another one here from Hank. Hank says to read section 801 of H25 and you will learn the interest investments may be subject to the sales tax. The interest in, the interest or investments are not, John, which I think you'll find if you read it more carefully, or Hank I mean, is that uh, the service charge or the service that is provided by whomever it is that is offering that investment is taxed under the fair tax. But Such any, broker, broker any, fee? any, yes, any, uh, any earnings, any profits from the investments are not taxed. And I'll go back and take a look at that. I'm not going to delete that one here. 805, section 801. I'll go back and take a look at that. Thanks, Hank. Uh, Josh has a question here. Do you pay the fair tax if you rent something? like a house that is for rent. Well, I would hope it would have to be for rent before you rented it. <laughs> uh, you you want to answer that, Ron? Yeah, rent is a service. And yes, the, the fair tax will be included in the cost of the rent, um, just like any other service. That's, that's true. But you have to remember also that the income tax or the, uh, that the, person is paying who owns the home or is owning the, the building that you're renting, all of those taxes go away so he's able to give you lower rent. So it, it, it all works out. That's right. It does. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. We go here. Here's another one from Josh. Is there an app for Fair Tax Power Radio? No, uh, we do not have an app. However, iTunes has a free app and Spreaker has a free app. 
so you can get to get if whether you're on iTunes or Spreaker, you can put one of their app on your smartphone and get to our show through their app. But we ourselves do not have no our ours is a very low budget program. We don't we have not created an app. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, there, Josh. Uh, let's see. Well, let's see. I got one from here. Hank, from here from Hank. Twenty-two percent includes worker withholding. Are you suggesting that we will all take a gross pay cut? I'm not sure I understand your question there, Hank. Twenty-two percent includes worker withholding. I don't see where it's a gross pay cut. I see where it's a increase in take-home pay, not a pay cut. I'm sorry, Hank, I don't quite follow you any on that. Um, Is he talking about the 22% embedded cost? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, John, here has, uh, where did he go? I lost John. Okay, John is saying, when people ask about the prebate, explain that its function is the same as the standard deduction. When tax the income, the standard deduction helps untax poverty. Under the fair tax, the prebate does the same thing, but better. Yep, and my radio partner, Bob Paxton, likes to compare it to a refund. You pay too much taxes, and when you file your taxes, you get it back at the end of the year. And you can, you can think of the prebate as a refund that you get back each month. Either way, it serves the same function. Except you don't have to wait till the end of the year to get it, because you get it each month in advance of spending it. Yeah. So that's, that's cool. Correct. Thanks, Josh. Hi, uh, John. Hi, uh, Josh again. Do you think Al Capone would be a fair tax supporter since he got arrested for tax evasion? <laughs> I, I guess that's a, that's a that's a very complex answer. Why? Yes. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Is there an app? Oh, I didn't delete that one. Hank, due to the prebate, tens of millions of lower income workers will pay no federal tax on any kind, of any kind, and get free Social Security. Is that fair? Well, Hank, if you put it that way and look at it in that narrow spectrum, uh, you might be able to conclude that it is not fair. However, under the, uh, under the income tax system, they essentially have the same thing, except instead of Social Security, they call it Medicaid. And uh, they still get that free med medical attention that they would want. And they still get the, the other benefits that people who are in their category would get under the income tax. So I think it washes out there, Hank, and they, uh, they are not cheating the rest of us. However, think oh. about this. If the low-income person who is today, because of their income, or their, I should say their claimed income, is at the poverty level, but they're working and making money under the table, which they are not reporting, under the fair tax, it doesn't matter, because when they spend that income, they will be paying taxes. So now, all of a sudden, they become contributors, not just leeches on the system. And there's another aspect of this, too. We're talking about low-income in uh, workers of, say, today. Well, the idea is to boost the economy so they're not, they don't remain low-income workers their whole lives, <clears throat> that things will get better, that they'll get a better job, or they'll, they'll get a promotion at, this, at their job, become a manager or something like that. Between what's happening now and the time they retire, hopefully their, their position is going to be a lot better and they will be paying, uh, you know, contributing. So it's, it's not a stagnant situation that we're talking about. You can also add to that that um, right now we have very few jobs and a lot of people looking for work. Under the fair tax, a lot of those jobs will multiply and pretty soon you're going to wind up with more jobs than you have people to fill them. In that case, competition sets in, people will offer higher wages or better uh, programs, uh, benefits. So uh, things, things will get much, much better. 
Okay, we have Barb on here who uh, indicates she's got a hand up, and so she's got a microphone or a telephone in her hand. Barb, are you listening? Yes, can you hear me? We sure can. Go for it. Wonderful. I just wanted to thank all three of you for a really good job of your presentation. And I wondered if you folks could maybe speak to the fact that even though we have 83 co-sponsors in the House and Senate, have you got any kind of report on the participation of both Republicans and Democrats in, in Congress? Uh, nothing more current than what I've had, and there are no Democrats involved as a co-sponsor. And uh, I think that goes back to when Nancy Pelosi became the leader of the uh, Democratic caucus, and she admonished the uh, party to not support the fair tax. If they did, they would not get support from her. And when that statement essentially says they won't get decent community assignments, and they may not get as much funds for their re-election campaign as they would like to have. So she really put the pressure on them to not support this. Although, when the fair tax was first entered uh, into the House of Representatives, it had four Republican and three Democrat co-sponsors on the bill. So she just, really? went, she just went against that tie. Thanks for that uh, question and comment, Barb. Good to hear from you. Okay, thank you. But I, I did want to add, um, I thought that I did hear from um, Mr. Pruitt. I think he's um, on the board of um, the national AFFT. And I think he was talking about more talk amongst the Democratic representatives, although they had their uh, concessions that they wanted. Um, but I, I thought that it was becoming more of a fair tax as a consumption tax was becoming more of a topic of discussion as part of a tax reform. Yay, yeah, okay. you're, you're right about that. that. You're right about that. And when uh, each yeah. month, when when our president uh, Stephen Hayes and uh, uh -huh. Peggy Ernst Green go to uh, Washington, they have been talking with Democratic representatives in the House and Senate also, and what they have been hearing from them, and this I'm sure is what Audrey Pruitt was referring to, is that because so many more people are starting businesses of their own now, the evasion rate, if you will, of income taxes is going up tremendously. And so the income tax is no longer the and they use this, this term loosely, but the income tax is no longer the efficient tax collecting system that it once was. And therefore, okay. in, order to, in order to compensate for that, the, con the uh, consumption allowance would be the best tool uh, in favor of an income tax. Thank you. You bet. Okay, somebody's phone's ringing. And that should do it for us for tonight, guys. Uh, appreciate everybody's participation. And uh, we're just just at 9 o'clock straight up. And for once in a while, once in a great while, we're going to finish on time. And, Ron and Elaine, thank you for your uh, work. I know of all of the experiences in your life, this has been one of them. And uh, I'm going to see to it that you get a link for the recorded session here so that you can take a listen, a look, and uh, see how you feel you did for yourself.